Hello everyone, thank you for watching today. Uh, we'll be talking about Deloitte's point of view on how to use AI to drive automation for clinical data from protocol creation to submission. My name is Sid Karya and I'm a principal in Deloitte's life sciences practice. Uh, I have over 15 years of experience working in clinical operations and clinical data management. And I'm Bill Baker, a specialist leader at Deloitte Life Science Practice. I've been working in the clinical data management and regulatory space in and with pharma and biotech companies since the 90s. Thanks, Bill. Before we dive into things, I want to establish our objectives for this presentation. First, we want to illustrate how AI and automation capabilities can bring about more efficient clinical trials. Next, we want to make it real and explore three use cases that really demonstrate how this automation should work. And finally, we want to review the potential benefits of using metadata-driven AI to automate the flow of data and maintain traceability throughout the life cycle of the trial. So first, how can AI and ML bring about more efficient clinical trials? What does the future look like? In recent years, the industry has made really significant investments in digitizing processes, moving to better workflow, and moving to the cloud. However, a number of challenges still exist today. Clinical trials continue to be the most significant component of time uh, and cost to bring a drug to market. Uh, and this time and cost keeps increasing everywhere. And although not all, a large part of the cost and inefficiency in clinical trials can be attributed to manual processes, poorly connected systems, and the flow of the core clinical data from start to finish. As data moves, uh, from protocols to CRS to programming and then to reporting, each step of the process has disparate tools that don't have common metadata. This means there is no single source of truth. There are lots of manual effort intensive processes to move this data from start to finish. And to complicate this further, as a protocol goes through amendments, which is inevitable, uh, it leads to significant rework and longer cycle time. You all know this. Today, when there is a change to a protocol, even sometimes very simple ones, the entire impact analysis and then the modification of systems, data mappings, tools, reconfiguration, all of these things are done by people and is extremely time consuming. Once we understand that, we can see how metadata driven technologies can help us get to a better outcome. The future is streamlined, fully connected and integrated data from start to finish. There is full traceability from uh, start to finish. So if a protocol goes through changes, it is easy to identify the impacts of these changes. Additionally, with the power of AI, incorporating these changes into the data lifecycle can also be automated and more streamlined. There is tremendous untapped potential in this space, and we'll get deeper into all of these ideas shortly. To realize the opportunities, let's take a look at the type of capabilities clinical organizations will need to invest in. Starting with the protocol builder. Modern technologies along with advancements in standards can be used to enable the creation of a digitized protocol. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can help provide smart recommendations and suggestions based on data from past studies. That combined with biomedical concepts being developed as part of CDIS standards as well as a common protocol template developed by Transcelerate, allow us to streamline the creation of a fully digitized protocol. From protocol builder, data flows down and automates other systems. The CRF builder automatically has all the metadata it needs once the study is built in the study builder. That metadata can then be configured for import into an EDC system. Uh, whether it's an ODM XML format or an ALS import file, this can automatically be generated. And I think the ability to do this is huge. I mean, the time spent by data managers and programmers interpreting the protocol and the schedule of activities would be eliminated. Thanks, Bill. Uh, from there, data flows into the statistical analysis plan uh, where protocol elements can be automatically included based on templated sections Additionally, there can be collaborative authoring of the statistical analysis plan. And all throughout there is metadata traceability linking back to the study builder, enabling automated updates, triggers, and review workflows. 
Next, data can flow into SDTM conversion, where data quality checks and source target mappings can be automated. We'll get into some more details about this later in our presentation. Tables, listings, and figures can also be created using digitized protocols and elements from the statistical analysis plan that are linked to standards. Automation of PLS is enabled by a recommendation engine and a graph database to manage semantic relationships between protocol elements, study definitions, and data standards. Based on all that metadata and advanced AI and ML analysis, PLS can also be automatically regenerated. Following PLS creation, a draft of the clinical study report can be automatically generated as well, similar to the statistical analysis plan. And just like Transcelerate's protocol template, they have templates for SAP and CSRs. And there is, of course, the, the industry standards defined in the 90s by ICH. Yep. To further illustrate how these how this metadata flows to each of these milestones in the clinical life cycle, let's take a look at the gray boxes on the screen to show a real example. If you're writing a protocol for a hypertension study, let's say, uh, you will need an endpoint related to vital signs. Uh, specifically for measuring blood pressure. Based on biomedical concepts and the structure of the underlying metadata in an end-to-end -end system, that endpoint can be automatically suggested. And once it's added to the study in the protocol builder, metadata about that endpoint can flow down to other capabilities needed in the life cycle. To expand on that, let's follow the metadata down this cycle. Because the system needs unique because the system knows you need vital signs, it will automatically include the correct vital sign forms in the casebook so that the necessary data will be collected. It can also annotate those CRFs and create a mapping to the SGTM vital signs domain. And since it's a hypertension study and the system knows you'll be doing analysis on the vital signs, it will know we need the vital signs Adam domain ADVS. Using a related analysis concept, it will also make recommendations for the type of evaluation and suggest some tables, listings, and figures that you may want to use. And finally, our vital science metadata will also help make suggestions for vital science summaries that should be included in the CSR. I want to re-emphasize that all this automation is made possible by two main things, machine learning, and advancements in clinical data standards, such as the development of biomedical and analysis concepts. The industry right now is investing heavily in AI and automation. And what I've discussed so far are the types of capabilities many pharma companies and technology companies, including Deloitte, are building out. Many are approaching these projects uh, and as siloed initiatives. But we believe the value for AI and automation in this space can only be realized the entire data life cycle is looked at and solved for end to end. Now I'm going to hand it over to Bill, who will focus on the three main use cases we're going to talk about. Thanks, Sid. As Sid mentioned, I'll be providing an overview of how a few of the steps could be implemented. The first step we're going to look at is the creation of the protocol and the schedule of activities. The protocol builder module should utilize meta driven. AI and ML to define studies key information that will be used to create the protocol document, which will also flow to the common protocol template, as well as reuse later in later modules. The next step we'll review is the information life cycle is to define the EDC's visits, forms, and fields needed to support the protocol. We will represent a few key tasks that should be supported in relation to the CRF. The last step we'll touch upon today is the SDTM conversion, where the study design data will be used once again to create CETA submission formatted data and the associated documentation needed for an NDA submission. Okay, let's dig into some details. The two main efficiency gains are based on capturing the common study date design details as early in the process as possible and the use of the biomedical and analysis concept metadata to link the study's data from protocol all the way through to the CSR. With that in mind, the main goal of the protocol builder should capture the study design details with the assistance of metadata-driven AIML. The collection of every piece of data should be optimized by using machine learning and standard industry libraries like CDISC and SNOMED, for example, 
to assist the user. As users begin to make selections, the application be working hard behind the scenes, deciding which choices to recommend for the next piece of information needed, each selection building on the one before it. The protocol builder should use AI and machine learning to create the choices for items like titles, objectives, and endpoints. For example, recommending titles that have efficacy in them for a phase three study, but not for a phase one study, or objectives and endpoints related to resist measurements for solid tumor studies. Another example is suggestion of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Most companies have run hundreds of studies with specific criteria depending on the type of the study and what has been successful in the past. And the system can automatically recommend what works for a new study that you try to start up. Yeah, good one. As with any application that utilizes machine learning, any choices and subsequent modifications should be used to train the model for further future studies. Tying the use of the machine learning to suggest endpoints, which utilize the power of the biomedical concepts and later with the analysis concepts, is what really enables the translation of the protocol information into the data collection, storage, and analysis elements that will be needed for the CSR. We'll discuss more on the biomedical concept in a minute. But after collecting the study details centered around the endpoints and the study epochs, the schedule of activities can be automatically generated. In fact, the entire protocol document following the common protocol template could be auto-generated. This in and of itself is helpful because how many times have we seen consistency issues in different protocol sections when we're using them to develop the ECRF? The efficiencies gains from reusing the study details also provides consistency and continuity between all the major deliverables created in later steps, such as the EDC specifications, SCTM, SAP, and the CSR. Now let's go back and take a look at the biomedical concepts. The information collected in the protocol builder should be captured as a biomedical concept metadata, which would then be passed downstream and used to support later tasks. The biomedical concept and analysis metadata would be the backbone that tie the objectives and endpoints to things like the schedule of activities, SDTM, the SAP, and TLFs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with biomedical concepts, but since they are so important, let me take a minute to provide an example. In the previous example Sid gave, we associated hypertension with the biomedical concept of vitals and through vitals to the biomedical concepts of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Those root biomedical concepts associated with their specific collection requirements and how it will be collected in EDC and how it will be stored in STTM. In this example graph illustrates the ECRF fields needed to collect and identify the systolic blood pressure. And just imagine that every field identified on this ECRF has this tree to bring it down to the exact level of what you need to be done. This level of detail provides that linkage that, and benefits that are required to feed the needs downstream. Let's spend a few minutes discussing the data collection by reviewing our second use case, the CRF Builder. The goal of the CRF Builder is to assist in the EDC setup by using the study design details to ensure 100% consistency with the protocol. The assistance should be provided in four ways. The first is to allow the study team to, to have a look at the CRF, look at the forms and how and let them be able to visualize how the, the protocol was interpreted and, and look at what the biomedical concepts are providing behind the scenes. The second is to provide the ability to view the forms and fields at each visit, which will help the data managers and programmers and statisticians better understand the structure of the incoming data. The third benefit is to produce detailed specifications that align with the study details. And if supported by the e your EDC tool, it should create a study design import file, such as ODM or ALS, to define the visit schedule forms and fields for the EDC system. And finally, at this point, you should be able to perform an impact analysis of the new version of the protocol compared to the previous snapshot or previous export. This impact analysis would highlight the protocol amendments changes to all downstream components. Because I'm sure we all have seen some minor protocol updates that have major impacts on what data was being collected or how it was being analyzed. 
we do a lot of work with our clients uh, and we found uh, working with them that on average, a typical trial has at least three, sometimes more amendments that happen that significantly impact the client with real impact to cost as well as cycle times. So you can see how something like this is so valuable when amendments happen uh, in driving the impact analysis and turning around the changes in a quick manner. Yeah, totally agree. I, I've seen pretty much having to create a whole new visit schedule, whole new forms as, as they, they've made an amendment that was very big. Um, but let's have a look at that biomedical concept graph again. And as you can see, we've added the red nodes and that associates the protocol endpoints to the SDTM storage location. So you can imagine using the analysis concepts we mentioned earlier, and the graph could be extended to include the atom files and, and structures and the TLF details to complete the picture. But speaking of the SDTM, let's have a look at use case three, the SDTM conversion. The goal of the SDTM conversion step is to create an CDISC standard database and associated documentation that could be used in a regulatory submission. Currently, the mapping of input data is done manually by programmers, or if you're fortunate, through some type of UI. The conversion should be done by having the machine learning algorithm utilize study design data and the input metadata already available. The input files could be from any current or future data source, including EDC, centrally collected data, such as labs or ECGs, or even wearable devices or electronic health records, to name a few. The algorithm should review a library of business rules to auto-select the business rules needed to map the study's data to the appropriate STTM domain variable and if applicable controlled terminology. The use of the defined business rules assists in both providing a consistent and proper mapping and providing the documentation details needed for the defined XML and reviewer's guide. Currently, no matter how your data is being populated in SDTM, the documentation is incomplete and inconsistent, which increases the level of effort in creating the submission documentation and also affects the quality of those documents. Applying a similar process, the system should be able to auto configure quality checks. And these checks should be able to support anything from simple range field checks to complex cross form checks to even STTM structure validation checks. Ideally, the business rules and quality checks should be automatically rerun against the data as new data is entered throughout the study. Each run should create exception, an exception report, which would then be evaluated to determine if any updates to the rules or checks are required. If, any, if there are any additions or updates to either a business rule or a quality check, um, they should be done with the assistance of a guided user interface, minimizing the need for programmer involvement. These additions and updates will be used to train the model for future studies. As a point of reference, Using our tool recently, we completed a study's conversion from input files to a fully compliant SDTM database and documentation in only two hours. Compare that to a four week effort, and you can appreciate the scale of improvement. So when we, we performed an analysis to determine both the cost and cycle time savings by sharing the study design information across the various tools used by the organization, we found over half a million dollars savings per study and over 10 weeks reduction from start of protocol to final CSR. Yes, and the additional advantage here is when amendments happen. Uh, an amendment typically has a direct cost of around half a million dollars on the trial. Uh, the indirect cost impact is two times or three times of that. So you can see, where, you know, given the size of a portfolio, a typical mid-size or a large pharma company is running, you, there is tremendous potential to bring efficiency into the entire cost for running trials uh, within an organization. With that, we thank you for your interest uh, and your time. Uh, we try to provide you with a feel for how the study design information can be used to automate much of the downstream processes for clinical data. Please feel free to reach out to us and connect with us to continue the dialogue. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.